Last time on As the Hive Turns. Oh my gosh! I can't believe he stung another queen! I swear! I slipped! Hello, I'm Admiral Bumblebee, and today I'm going to teach you how to write a Rhea script. This is a script in Reaper that lets you do darn near anything you want. But before I teach you how to do it, let me show you what we're going to write. First, here's what our problem is. As you heard, and as you can see, we have a bass guitar and a kick drum. They both hit on the downbeat, and one little extra in there. And this means that the low frequencies are constantly clashing. We want to do something about that. Reaper has a concept called automation items. These encapsulate automation information, and multiple automation items can be mirrored so they always have the same information. What our script is going to do is it is going to take every single kick drum hit, and then it is going to put an automation item on the bass track where the kick drum hits. So we'll have automation items on the bass track's volume envelope, but only where the kick drum hits. So we can turn down the bass track when the kick drum hits. So let's see how that works. The first thing we need to do for this script to work is we need to split the kick drum hits all into their own media items. So hit D for the dynamic split items window, set it to split selected items, hit split. Now each and every kick drum hit is its own item. Now we can use the script. Click the track with the kick drum, click get track, open up the envelope on the bass for volume so I hit the V key by default, select the envelope that we want to affect, click get envelope, and now just click do it. As you can see, we now have automation items on every single hit of the kick drum, but on the bass track. And if I click one of these and I adjust it, all of them adjust at the exact same time. So now if you look closely, on the bass track, every time the kick drum hits, the bass is turned down. So I'll turn that down like this a little bit. And now let's listen to it. Every time the kick drum hits, the bass is turned down. And we can control how every single one of these automation items behaves by adjusting one of them. Now you know how it works? So let's write this from scratch. Here I am in a default installation of Reaper without any of my fancy things. But before we start, we need to install two things. First, go to swsextension.org and install SWS extensions. Follow directions for your platform. I'm not going to go through that. Next, we need to go to reapack.com and install reapack. Once again, how you install this depends on your platform and your installation of Reaper. So go to the user guide and follow the directions there. The first thing we're going to do is install something that lets me teach you one of Reaper's scripting languages. So now that you have SWS and reapack installed, Go to your extensions menu, reapack, and then browse packages. We're going to search for the word interactive and right click interactive Rea script. Click install, and that does not install it. Now you need to click apply. It is now installed. We'll hit shift forward slash or just question mark, and we'll search for interactive. We select that and hit run. This will let us test Lua code. So what is Lua? Lua is a programming language that we're going to use to write our script in. One of the first things you'll need to know is the concept of a variable. A variable is basically a word that stores a value. So I can type something like, and now a equals one. That means if I type print a, which prints out the value of a, 
I get one. So now we can store data inside of words, and that lets us refer to that data later by using the word or identifier that we assigned it to. It's important to understand that variables have something called types. Not all variables hold the same information. Like here, A holds an integer or a number. But we can type something like B equals hello. Hit enter. Now B contains what is called a string. A string is characters or words. So if I type print B, it prints hello. But if later I want to send this data to something that is expecting a number, it won't work because B contains a string. I would need to send something that contains a number. There are a bunch of different types in Lua, but we will only be concerning ourselves with three of them. Numbers, like A, strings, like B, and something that's called nil, which means nothing at all. It also is used as a falsy term, but don't worry about that right now. Okay, I actually lied. There is one more type. What if we want to have a variable that contains a bunch of different data, like this? Now, the word numbers contains four strings, one, two, four, and three. So we can contain four strings in one number. That data type is called a table. It is defined by curly braces and commas between the elements. So what if we want to access just one of those values? We need to use square brackets. So I type numbers square bracket two, and that will equal the second value inside of numbers, which is two. Often when we do things in programming, we want to put similar ideas in little blocks, and then we can call those blocks later. This concept is called functions. So what we can do is define a function using the keyword function, followed by the name and an opening and closing parentheses. So I'm going to write something real quick. Now we have a function called add numbers. I can call this function by typing add numbers, then the parentheses, and hitting enter. This will do everything between the word function and end. So I declare two variables, I add them and put them in a third variable, and then I print out the third variable. When writing functions in the interactive RIA script, you need to type shift enter to add something to the whole line. For instance, function add numbers followed by everything else to end, I had to hit shift enter because I want this all to be part of the same code, not just one line. You don't need to worry about that when writing code later on. This only matters in the interactive RIA script window. So sometimes you want to send data to your function so that the function can do something with the data. And you want to get data back from the function. So let's give that a try. All right, after failing once there, again, I have a function that takes two variables. So to use that, I type, and now here is where I pass information. So I can type one comma two. This will make the function use one for A and two for B. Now I'll hit enter. When it's done, you can see that this word return it does something with the data, it puts A plus B into C, and it returns C. So now whatever called add numbers, so whatever called add numbers will get the result of adding the two arguments that you send to it. So now we have a function that takes in data and it gives data back to whatever called it. The interactive RIA script window is great for testing code, but now we're going to move on to using the real editor in Reaper. Close Interactive Rea Script, 
Open the action list with shift forward slash or question mark. Now we're under RIA script, we're going to click new. Save it to wherever you want. And now we get an editor that we can edit code inside of. So let's write our first code in the editor. When you hit Control S on Windows or Linux, or Command S on Mac, it'll save the script and run it. So, what's happened here? Well, a few things. We declared variables A and B, then we created a function called addNumbers that adds A and B together and assigns it to C with a curious little word, local. Then we use a new function to show a message in Reaper, after the function, we call the function, and then we try to print C again. This little script is showing something called scope. The word local says that the variable C is only visible inside that block. So from function to end is the only place that C exists. So let's look at what happens when we run this script again. Rather curious. First, Reaper printed a message, and then it gave us an error. Inside the function where C is available due to its locality, the Reaper.showConsole message was able to access the variable C. Outside of the function, when we tried to access C, C no longer exists because it's local only to that function. So when we try to access C, we get an error, and it tells us bad argument to show console message, string expected on line 11. It says it got nil because C does not exist and nil means nothing. So what about that reaper.show console message? What is that and where do we find similar things to interact with Reaper? To get RIA script documentation, go to the help menu and click RIA script documentation. It'll open the documentation in your web browser for you. Here I'm going to use the search feature of my browser by hitting Command F or Control F on Windows and Linux. Hit enter and then I'll find the function. I click the function and I can find the definition of it. We'll get back to this later and I'll teach you more about how to use this. Reaper's documentation isn't formatted that nicely and sometimes it's missing some information that can be really helpful. So Raymond Redet has formatted all of the Reaper documentation in a really nice way and added some extra notes to it. The link to this documentation is in my text post, and you can get it in the description below. So let's get back to coding. Sometime when programming, sometimes when programming, you need to make decisions. For instance, if a equals 1, we do something. If a equals 2, then we do something else. Let me write some code real quick to demonstrate this. So we've written some code here where I use a function that comes with Lua called math.random which generates a random number between 1 and 5. Below that, I use what's called an if statement. It says, if a is equal to, and when we're doing comparison, we use two equal signs. One equal sign only assigns values. Two equal signs compares the values. So if a is equal to 3, then we show a in the console. Otherwise, we do nothing at all. Let's try it out. Nothing happened. A must not equal 3. Nothing happened again. Nothing happened again. Oh, I clicked it enough times and eventually A equals 3. And then we got console output. Awesome. But what if we need to do multiple things? What if we want to do one thing when A equals 3, but if a doesn't equal 3, then we do something else. So let's write some code for that. Now we have added an else statement, which will happen if a does not equal 3. So we show a message that says failure. We'll just try writing the script a couple times here. So each time we do the script, it'll say failure or 3, depending on if A has been assigned a random value that equals 3 or something else. Another thing we can do is add additional comparisons. So if A equals 3, we do one thing. 
but let's try something else. Now, if a equals 4, we print something different to the console. If a equals 3, we just print what a is. And if a equals 4, then we print the string a equals sign equals sign 4. If it's anything else, we write failure. Let's try this a few times. So that worked nicely. However, there is an issue. We want all of these messages to go on a new line. I'll just add some quick code here. Now when we use this script, we'll get a new line because the slash n gives us a new line after whatever text is there. Let's try that out. Excellent, everything is on a new line. But what about this little line here, the dot dot? That dot dot combines two things into a string. So we take the number of a and we combined it with a new line. Awesome, let's move on to the next topic. Before, when we talked about tables, we said that they can store multiple pieces of data in a single variable. But what if we wanted to act on all of those pieces of data in one go? That's when we would use a loop. So when I run this code, it is going to go from one to four. And on each time through the loop, it's going to assign i to whatever variable it is at that point. So i will equal one to start with, then two, then three, then four. Each time it does that, it's going to show a console message accessing numbers. And remember before, we can access the current data in numbers using the index. So i in this case is going to equal one, two, three, then four. So we'll end up printing out each one of the pieces of data in numbers in a loop. Let's try it out. It's exactly what we thought. It goes from numbers one, then numbers two, then numbers three, then numbers four. Tables in Lua are actually what are called associative arrays. Each one of the pieces of data have what's called a key and a value. So what we can do is treat each one of these pieces of data as a pair. Let me write some code and then we'll explain it further. Now let's see what happens when we run this code. The key for the first value is one. The key for the second is two, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're doing is we're assigning the key and the value to the variables key and value. In the pairs, each one of these is actually a pair. And then we print it out, key, add that to a dash, value, add that to a new line. This may not totally make sense right now, but as you improve in your Lua skills, you will find that you use this very often. Let's just move on right now. The last thing that we really need to discuss is the fact that you don't really want to write a bunch of functions yourself. So we can use what are called libraries. We can take other people's code and we can use it, like Locusena's GUI library, which we'll be using later. That allows us to use other people's code that they have written and make it do things for what we want. Now we get to do the fun part and actually write the script. So we know we need to do two things. We need to get the selected track and we need to get the selected envelope. I've opened the Rescript documentation and I'm just going to search for the word selected. And I will look at all the things that have been highlighted until I find the thing that looks like it might get what I want. Oh, here we go. We have get selected envelope and get selected track. Let's look at get selected track. I'm gonna click it. Here we go. So what do we have here? This tells us how we use the function in Lua. The first thing is the return value of the function. So when we use this function, 
it's going to give us back something of the type media track. So anytime we see a function that needs a media track, we know we can use the data that we got back from the get selected track function. The first argument is PROJ, which is just zero. That means the first project. And the next thing is the selected track ID. Since you can select multiple tracks, Reaper wants to know which of the selected tracks you want. We'll always select the first track, which is zero. So let's go back and let's look at get selected envelope. This returns a track envelope type, and all it needs to know is the current project, because you can only select one envelope at a time. So let's implement this. So I have assigned the selected track to cell underscore track, and the selected envelope to cell underscore envelope. So anytime we need a media track, I can send cell track to the function. Anytime we need a track envelope, I can send cell env to it. So from now on, we can work with media tracks and envelopes. So what's the next thing we need to do? Well, what happens if there is no selected track and there is no selected envelope? Let's take care of that with if statements. Now we have a framework to do things and to send errors if we don't have the information we need. If there is a selected track, we can put stuff in this area. If there is no selected track, it sends up a message box telling the user to select the track. It's likely that we'll want to utilize this other code from another function, so it would be best that each of these things were their own function. So I'm going to put these in their own function and rework the logic slightly. Now we have a function that we can use to get the selected track. But this time, we only throw an error if there's not a selected track, as in here. If not select track, then we throw an error. And we did the same thing for envelope, except for with a slight misspelling. Now we need to do some real work. We need to have a main function from where everything starts. So, I'm going to write that real quick, and then I'll explain how everything works. All right, so here we are. We made a new function called main, where I forgot to put end. That's very important because Lua needs to know where your function ends. We called get track and get envelope. So we have a selected track and a selected envelope. Now we use a command to deselect all tracks. Then we select the track that we stored as our main selected track. Then we select all of the media items on the track. In order to loop through all of our media items that we have selected, we need to know the number of media items. So we use the function count selected media items and we store that in a variable named item count. Now we loop through all of the items, from the first item to the number of items we have minus one, because Reaper expects from zero to minus one of the maximum number of items. We use get selected media item, which wants to know the current project and the index. So this will loop through all of the media items and we'll get the first item, then the second item, then the third item, etc., etc. Now we're going to use a function called get media item info value. We send the current selected item to this along with a string that says which information that we want. And we want the position and this is sent to ipause. And now we send out our value. So let's give this a shot. Actually before we continue I had to pause the video and I forgot we actually need to call our main function at the very end. If we never call the function, it'll never happen. So now we select the track, we select an envelope, and we hit run. Perfect. Now we know the positions of all of our media items, just like that. It cleared all of the track selections. It selected the track that we wanted selected. It selected all of the media items. It counted the media items, 
it looped through the media items, and each time it would get the selected media item of that index, it would take the position, and it would print the position in our console. Now that we know the position of each media item, we can go through and create automation items at those positions in the selected envelope. All right, so now instead of printing the positions of the media items to the console, what we want to do is add some code, which I'm going to copy and paste real quick, that will add the automation items. So there's a little quirk here. I'm going to make this window a little bit larger. In the version of Reaper as I'm recording this, 5.95, the first automation item has to be created with a pool index of minus one. Look up insert automation item in your documentation to learn what you need to send to it. The first one needs to be set to minus one. So in our loop, we check if i equals zero, which tells us this is our first time through the loop. Then we find out what the ID is of the automation item that we just created with the pool ID of negative one. And then if we're not on the first automation item, we know the pool ID so we can create each subsequent automation item with the same pool ID. When automation items have the same pool ID, they will contain the same information. So let's go ahead and save this while I have a track selected and an envelope selected and let's see if it works. Oops, that's a variable that we haven't discussed yet. Let's set the automation item to one. And there we go. At the start of every media item, we now have an automation item with a length of one second. So we want maybe to do something else with the length of the automation items. I propose that we write a function that loops through all of our media items and it finds out which one is the shortest. Then it sets the length of all of the automation items to the length of the shortest media item. So, I'm going to copy and paste that code in here and then I will explain it to you. So, we have a function now called getLength. And what this does is it first gets the number of selected media items and it loops through the media items just as we did before. It gets the selected media item in the loop. It gets the length of the media item. Then if we are on the first part of the loop, we set the min lang value to the length of the media item. For each subsequent loop through, we use a function called math.min. And what this does is it takes the current selected media item's length and it compares it against whatever our running minimum length is. And whichever one is lower, we assign to the minimum length. So every time we go through this, we check our current running value, and then we compare it against whatever the current selected media item is in the loop so far, and we take the lower one. After we do this loop, we return the value. And since we have constantly taken the smallest value, we will be returning the length of the smallest media item. So I will implement that, and we will see if that works. All right, so let's save this and see if it works. And it looks like it did. We have media items that are the length of the smallest item, except for the first one because I forgot to put our AI length, which is the return value of the function we created into the first automation item that we create. So that one ended up one second. Bugs happen and you got to fix them. Now let's move on. Now that we have working code that I just fixed, we're going to want to build ourselves a GUI. So let's open up Reapack because we want to use somebody else's library for this. Go to browse packages, type GUI, and we will install Locusena's GUI library v2 for Lua and the developer tools. Select both, right click, install, click apply. 
Now they're installed, but there's one thing we still have to do. Open up the actions list with shift forward slash or the question mark, type GUI, and we need to set the library path because it won't work otherwise. So select this action and click run. Now it's set and everything should work. We want to open up the GUI builder now, which will let us graphically create our GUI and then we can hook up our code to it. To add some sort of GUI widget, you right click and you add your widget. If you want to move the thing around, you hold shift and click it, select it, and then you can move it around. This also lets you edit attributes of it. Once you're done, you go to File, Export, and you save your thing to the Developer Tools Library slash GUI Builder. So we'll do Export a GUI. Now I will go to my Reaper folder and I will open this file. It's going to be under, for me, my scripts directory, RIA team scripts, development, look, send a GUI, developer tools, GUI builder, export a GUI, and there it is. So we're gonna open this up with, uh, let's do subline text for now. So, yeah. So this is what it looks like, and I want you to go ahead and make something that looks like this. Go ahead and pause the video and look at that and replicate that. That is a text box, a text box, a text box, and then five buttons. It doesn't need to be placed perfectly like that, we just need those items. So we're going to hop over to Sublime Text here again. And this is where our GUI is. This is what mine looks like. I have my button, my button to get the track, my button to get the envelope, my button to clear things, I have buttons to do things, and I have my text boxes. So I want you to open this up and then go back to your other code, take that, copy it, in between where you see this GUI anchor and then where you see the buttons, I want you to paste your code. There is a way where you can keep the GUI code in a separate file and load it from your main script, but we're not gonna mess with that right now. Since our GUI is going to execute the main function, we don't need to execute the main function in the code. The button will do that. So we're going to save this to a new file And then we'll go back to Reaper and open that up. In order for the GUI to do things, the buttons need to know what function should be called when they're pressed. So we're gonna go down here and we're going to find one of our buttons. Let's go with the get track button. And at the very last item, I'm going to add a comma and then I'm going to put func equals get track. And that tells the button that the function it should call is get track. So I want you to go through and add functions for the clear envelope buttons, the clear track buttons, and the get envelope buttons. You'll notice, of course, that we did not create any clear envelope functions. You'll have to create those yourself. You'll probably also want to add a button to do the whole thing. My do it button will call the main function. You want to be careful though. You don't want to do it like this because when you put the parentheses, that calls the function immediately. We only want to tell the GUI what the name of the function is. We don't want to call the function ourselves. The next thing we want to do is interact with the GUI when things are successful. So let's go to our get track function. When there's an error, we show the error message. But when we do find the track, how about we update the GUI with the name of the track? So now, if we do find a track, we go and we use get media track info string. 
Look that up to see what happens. However, there's a trick here. This one returns two values. So let's go look that up in Chrome real quick. If we look in Lua, it says retval and string need big. So it's returning us two values. How do we deal with two return values? Well, we only want one of them. We want the second one. So what we can do is a multiple variable assignment where we use commas between each variable and the function will assign those variables in order of the return values. Think about that for a second. The underscore here says that we don't care about the first return value and we want to assign the second return value to a variable named track name. From there, we update our GUI, the cur track text button, which is the name of the button that I set, and we set that to the name of the track. See if you can set up the getEnv function by yourself. If you can't figure it out, go look in the description and go to the text article on the website, which will give you much more detailed information. So hopefully you've set up the getM function and maybe done the clear buttons yourself. But there's one more thing we need to do. Our getLength function, which I'm sure you hooked up, still only uses the minimum length. What we want to do is we want to only use the minimum length if the GUI box is empty. So let's set that up real quick. First we get the value of the len text text box. We set that to a variable. If that variable is equal to nothing, remember we use the double equal signs, then we do our minimum length. If the variable has something in it, then we simply return the GUI lane, but we use a function called toNumber. That converts our string to a number. I'll leave it to you to figure out what you should do if it's not a number. Look up the Lua documentation to figure out more. So at this point, if you've taken time to pause the video and fill in the blanks, or if you've gone to AdmiralWomblebee.com and checked out the article, which is also linked in the description, then you have a fully working script. So let's go ahead and just test this out. I'm just going to hit save, and that'll run the script. So I want to get the track. I'm going to open up the envelope of the base track, select the envelope, get envelope. I'm going to set the length of my automation items to half a second and then I'm going to click do it. And there we go. Now I can turn down the bass every single time the kick drum hits. And I can do it with a custom envelope of my choosing. If I want a really weird shape, I can do that. If I want to turn the bass up at the end, I can do that too. And there we go. All right, guys. In order to fully understand this video, you probably need to go to AdmiralBumblebee.com and check out the article that I wrote. There's an equally long article that explains all of this. It'll be linked in the description. Rescripting is not hard. You just build it up piece by piece, and eventually you end up with this monster of text that you can barely understand yourself. And over time, you get better at understanding it. It just takes practice, just like music. You add a little piece, you add a little piece, you add a little piece, and eventually you just have this monster thing that is actually what you wanted. It's just a lot of work to get there, a lot of small blocks. I haven't taught you everything there is to know about Lua. I hope your curiosity can get you far into the depths of the internet so that you can learn more about Lua, learn more about Rhea scripting, go on the Reaper forums, ask a bunch of questions. Check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Admiral Bumblebee. Hit the dislike button or hit the like button today. I don't care. I'll see you later. If you made it this far to the video, you're an awesome person. Thank you.